Okay, hey, welcome everyone to TAM Lab number 67. Uh, today we're excited to have Kelly Dare and Scotty Ray joining us to walk us through vSphere 7 with Kubernetes. So this is a, a very exciting session. So without any further ado, I'm going to stop my sharing and I'll hand it over to them. Hi everybody, um, my name is Kelly Dare and uh, I'm gonna do the intro for this session. Just give you a little bit of background on why VMware has kind of gone all in with Kubernetes and brought it into our core. And uh, then I'm gonna hand it over to Scotty Ray. He's gonna do a little bit, uh, or actually all of the demo and the further uh, questions and things on that. Um, so uh, Scotty, you wanna introduce yourself real quick? Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, my name's Scotty Ray. I'm within the, uh, our MapBU team, uh, SE, uh, basically on all things around our you know, cloud native and Kubernetes uh, product set. So glad to be here today. All right, well, let's get started. Quick note on licensing. Um, whether you are a customer, or whether you're working with customers, I've seen a lot of misconceptions about this, so I wanted to mention it. Um, just having vSphere with the ability to upgrade to vSphere 7 does not mean that you have this Kubernetes feature. Um, so you may be entitled to it, but it is never going to be automatically delivered to your license portal. So I don't want customers to get all excited about using this and then find out um, of the, on the, the wrong side when they, uh, when they try, to, try it out that they don't have access. So if you're a customer, check with your TAM or your VMware account team or your internal licensing resources to figure out your situation. Um, if you're internal to VMware, um, ask around, there's some documents. <laughs> Um, so why do we do this? Why does uh, VMware consider Kubernetes such an important part of the infrastructure to, to bring it into vSphere? Um, first of all, declarative infrastructure. Um, there's a whole lot of power to be able to say, this is how I want my infrastructure, and then have some other entity continually looking at it and making sure that it, um, that it stays that way. Um, the instantiation and the maintenance of Kubernetes is really difficult. You see the whole tool set there. We want to simplify the process of getting Kubernetes up and running and more importantly, maintaining it, um, keeping it up to date, keeping it proper. Um, and finally, we need our developers and our infrastructure people to be able to consume it easily and to keep their own tool sets. Um, nobody wants to retool or relearn things um, when they can avoid it. So, First, we're gonna look at Kubernetes architecture at a really high level. Um, you have your control nodes over here on the left, and then you have your worker nodes on the right. And basically what's going on here is the control node takes in the declaration of how your environment should look. And then it goes out to the worker nodes and makes your environment look like you've asked it to. The right number of re replicas running, your pods look as they should, things like that. Um, so it's constantly observing What's the desired state of our objects? We're checking the differences. Has anything changed? Do we need to take any actions? We take actions if necessary, and then we repeat this just over and over and over again. So you declare it once, and Kubernetes makes sure that it stays the way you've asked for it. So here's a little animation that, that kind of shows some of that for you. You have um, your intent comes in, and then your intent is written to the database. So we have a permanent record of what, what is good, what does good look like. Um, we go out to the controller with that information and the controller goes out into the world and creates the environment as you, you've initially asked for it. Then your intent changes. You want your service to increase. You want to scale something up, whatever. Um, that's written to the database. So now your, your permanent record shows that you want it to be bigger. It goes out to the controller, and then we do the same in, in the world. We make your service larger, we, we scale something, et cetera. And as always happens in the world, something goes wrong. <laughs> something happens in production. We have, you know, containers have um, gone offline. There's something, something wrong in your system based on what your intent was. Well, your controller is constantly looking at the state of the world and it finds that, you know, foo has shrunk. So it goes and creates it again to match what is, what the permanent record is of the database. So that sounds good. Seems like people would want that, but what does it take to get there? You've got your infrastructure and you've got your container runtime. That's the simplest um, way to look at that. But on top of the container runtime, you have all of these other things that you need to happen with your containers. You need scheduling, orchestration, and deployment, and scaling. 
And that's what Kubernetes does for your container runtime. But to get there, you have all these layers you need to build up to connect these two areas. You need to manage your, your storage. Some storage needs to persist. Some storage is ephemeral. You'll need to figure out how to instantiate that and how to manage that moving forward. Your networking can be pretty complex. Um, we have load balancing that will happen at the edge of an application or in the middle of an application, between different tiers of an application. Um, some containers are gonna need access to the outside world, some won't. You want some pods that are fenced. So there's a lot of things to consider there. Um, you're gonna have to authenticate and that can be more complex than you might think um, because your provider and your consumer are gonna be accessing the same API. And finally, you have to have some place to store your images. You have to have your image registry um, where you're gonna store and access your, your container images. So a lot of, uh, then once you have all those things, the hardest part is this, uh, this orange line here, this, the day two stuff. You have to monitor the health of your clusters. You need to heal it when something's wrong. Um, and lifecycle management is, is a big issue. Kubernetes is rapidly developing and you are gonna have to um, stay up with updates quarterly or more in most cases. So all these different tools, the icons that are popping up here have been created by different parts of the community to help with this. Um, but none of these will, will scale across every single type of Kubernetes environment that you might want. All the different cloud providers, your, your uh, internal clouds, things like that. So the community has standardized on something called Cluster API. And what that is doing is providing commonality uh, on how we're gonna instantiate clusters and work with them through their life cycle. So we're essentially using Kubernetes to deploy Kubernetes. So your cluster specification over here is um, you know, an image of a YAML file that's, that's declaring what you want your Kubernetes cluster to look like. And if you've been following vSphere 7 in general, that should seem familiar because we're doing that with ESX clusters now too. Um, we're trying to go, go one step up from just the, the host profile. Now we have a cluster profile. So same thing here. And cluster API is the, the language, the layer that is going to take your declaration of what your Kubernetes cluster should look like. And it's going to take it out to your, your provider, whoever that provider is. So we're doing the same thing in all of these providers over on the right, AWS, Google, VMware, et cetera. But they all speak a little bit different dialect, if you will. You know, you're deploying on vSphere, you're gonna need an OVA or an OVF, you're gonna need VMDKs. For Amazon, it's a, a, an AMI. For different uh, other clouds, we're gonna have slightly different ways to, to get there. So Cluster API is the layer that is um, reconciling all that information out to these different clouds. So it's not a proprietary VMware API. So the community is going to continue to, um, to revision that and make it more extensible, make it do more things. And since we are using the community-based API, any extra extensibility, any extra goodness that comes into cluster API will also be available in vSphere. And when your developers are deploying to any of these different types of, of nodes, um, they can use the same language, the same tool set. So developers and infrastructure both can get what they need here. Um, developers have a standard Kubernetes, <clears throat> excuse me, standard Kubernetes functionality. Um, we have a little bit of, of special VMware stuff in our Kubernetes, but not, not enough to, to make too many changes. And Scotty, I'm sure we'll, we'll mention some of that later. Um, there's no rework from other Kubernetes deployments. Um, for the infrastructure side of things, you have your standard vSphere platform, you've got your visibility into your container environment with no extra uh, effort. And for both sides, your internal clouds are more appealing and more flexible. If your developers want Kubernetes and you can easily provide it internally, then that makes you more popular. <laughs> it makes your life easier. Both sides have no change in their tool set or their workflow. And as I said before, this is a community standard cluster API. So as that gets extended, it's gonna be automatically part of vSphere. So I hope that, uh, that helped give you a little overview of why, we, uh, why we've done this, why we brought it into vSphere. 
And now I'm going to pass it to Scotty to uh, show you exactly how all that works inside, um, inside vCenter. Awesome. All right. Uh, let's share my screen here. Hope everybody's doing well today. All right. Screen is shared. Um, can everybody see what looks like a vSphere client? No. No, no I cannot. Okay. <laughs> Wow, I just started off strong here today. There we go. There we go. How is that? It's strike one, but you're fine. We're good. <laughs> now we see it. All right, all right. So, you know, we can go through, uh, there's a lot to this, you know, as Kelly was talking about, there's this whole transition that's happening, you know, in, in terms of how do we want to bring declarative patterns, not just to application sets, but to also infrastructure as well. But the last point I think is really important when it comes to vSphere 7 with Kubernetes. vSphere 7 with Kubernetes is essentially trying to do a few things. It's solving some operator problems, uh, some platform operator problems, and helping to bridge the gap so that platform operators can operate potentially in ways and patterns that they're familiar with, but at the same time giving sort of developers, um, not really even so much developers, because um, developers really are just more concerned about their code. It's really more about you know, maybe DevOps is a name that gets thrown around or, or, or a platform team um, that's responsible for delivering the Kubernetes API, being able to sort of bridge the gap and, and allow them to work in ways that they want to work. And so I thought about how can we go through this and, and make it so that uh, this is consumable and sort of understandable where we're going. And so what we're going to do is we're going to tell a story. And so I've got Kelly and she is a rock star uh, in our organization. She's managing Kubernetes API and she's been doing Kubernetes sort of in her own way, you know, kind of testing things out with the development teams that she supports. And so Kelly is, you know, wanting to do more in the sense of she wants to provide platform services. She wants to develop caching services and databases of services and, and other types of, of policies for the developers that are going to consume things. And she really would rather the infrastructure team, my team, to, to kind of handle things. And so luckily for her, I've kind of gone through and, and, and done some things here to enable this new capability inside of vSphere. So just a couple of things about how we prepped this environment here. So we can see that I've got a basic vSphere cluster. I've got vCenter up here, data center cluster. I've got four hosts in this cluster. And you'll notice that we see the familiar resource pool object here. And inside here, I've got some base infrastructure. This is my vCenter and NSX. It's a small lab environment, so everything is sort of self-contained. Um, but I've got this other new resource object here called namespaces. And we think about namespaces as being in the context of a Kubernetes cluster. And so a namespace is sort of an organizational component. And we see these three VMs here called a control plane VM. When Kelly was talking about uh, the uh, model of cluster API, leveraging Kubernetes to deploy Kubernetes, there is a point there where we talk about a management cluster. Not unlike sort of a general concept of having a management cluster, instantiating and having special purposes and maybe workload clusters, inside of the cluster API model, we're going to have a Kubernetes cluster that primarily operates as a management cluster. It doesn't mean I can't deploy pods and workloads, you know, inside that cluster. But that management cluster is going to be sort of a special cluster that we're going to interact with to declaratively deploy not just workloads, but also other Kubernetes clusters that are there. In the vSphere 7 with Kubernetes uh, lexicon, we use the term supervisor cluster as opposed to management cluster in this. And so how did I build these VMs? Well, we have a new capability inside of vSphere 7 with Kubernetes called workload management. And in workload management, um, I run through a wizard. Now, in the purpose of not sort of watching paint dry here, um, essentially you would get a screen that says, I want to enable that, and it would present you with clusters um, that are eligible for workload management, and I would answer a few questions, and answering those few questions, kick off an automation framework. And that automation framework would ultimately deploy these three VMs, these are going to represent the control plane of my supervisor cluster. So this is where your API server is. This is where your etcd server is, your controllers. All of the things that you would expect to be in a normal Kubernetes control plane are in those three VMs. And I can do some things here, like I can tell them I want them to be small or medium or large. Uh, those kinds of things um, sit back. I'm going to tell it things like uh, some networking information. So... I want my VMs to sort of start, you know, in this particular range. This happens to be a subnet in my management range. 
I can set up here what, what edge cluster in NSX I'm gonna use when I need to get out of this environment and expose you know, services outside. And then I'm gonna have some, some IPs that are set aside anytime I need to expose ingress or egress services to the outside world. And so I, I basically create a couple of pools of, of addresses that are ultimately then gonna be consumed a little bit later on. The wizard is also gonna ask me about storage and so in this scenario here, what I've done is I've created a tag here, vSphere 7 with Kubernetes, and inside my data stores, what I've done is very easily and a very familiar pattern for me as, as an infrastructure team is I've gone to my data store here. You can see that I've got one vSAN data store. There could be multiple data stores here. And I've created a tag, and on that tag, I've created a policy that's based on that tag. And so when I'm in my, um, my environment here, and I'm taking a look at the configuration, I can select one or more data stores depending on whether I'm talking about where do I wanna store the VMDKs associated with the control planes or ephemeral disks or image caching if I'm you know, pulling images from you know, a Harbor registry or something of that nature. Um, there's some default certificate uh, stuff that's there. And if I wanted to enable an embedded Harbor registry um, directly for the supervisor cluster, I could just simply do a one click here and it would deploy um, an embedded Harbor registry that would be plumbed up. I haven't done that in my lab here today just because of some resource things and a couple other things that I, that I, that I wanted to show. You don't have to use this embedded Harbor registry. If you have uh, another registry, maybe an external Harbor 2.0 or uh, JFrog or you know, other registries that are out there, you can still certainly use those. But this just, again, allows me as an infrastructure person to kind of set up some basic blocking and tackling without actually having to understand maybe a lot of the gory details uh, associated with, uh, with a Kubernetes environment. So uh, real quick, um, yeah. you mentioned you haven't enabled it. Is it just because you're concerned about maybe storage in your lab or is there another you know, reason why Harbor might take up more resources than you, than you want to you know, give it? No, it's, 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 uh, it's really just my lab environment. I've been doing some other testing uh, for the company in other ways, and so I had to conserve some resources. <laughs> okay, perfect. No, cool. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so, so I've got this thing sort of set up um, and, and ready to go. And again, Kelly, she's coming to me and she's going, okay, Scotty, I'm, I'm tired of managing this, but I need an environment to set up to, to support this application team um, that, that, that I need to deal with. So can you help me out? And so now I want to try to provide her, all right, who she's my internal customer. I want to try to provide her an area where she can deploy cloud native workloads, where she can deploy Kubernetes clusters, et cetera. So this is in fact now a Kubernetes cluster. You have my control plane VMs and inside these now my ESX host becomes the worker node. So inside of ESX, we have what's called a spherelet because we're cute like that. Uh, we have, you know, kubelets in, uh, you know, upstream Kubernetes. We have a spherelet process that's there. And so now this ESXi host has another personality. It not only is running traditional heritage workload VMs, but it's now going to also be able to run native or, or pods directly as a first class citizen um, on the hypervisor. And I'm going to show you that in just a few minutes as well. But let's get back to Kelly. She's been patiently waiting uh, for, for, for this environment. So, she comes to me and says, Scotty, what, what do I need to do? Well, I'm going to set Kelly up a, a namespace, which is very similar to a resource pool, right? So again, a familiar pattern for me as a vSphere admin. And so how do I, how do, I do that? Well, I'm going to go into my workload management, and I've got this area here called namespaces. Don't worry about the test uh, namespace there. We're going to do a little cooking show trick here a little bit later. We're going to create a new namespace, and we're going to create this namespace for, uh, for Kelly. And so we're going to go in here and we'll call this, uh, uh, if I could type Kelly's name because she gets mad when I don't type it correctly. All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll give this the Kelly namespace here. So we're going to create this namespace. And now I've got an organization. I've got a resource pool fundamentally. I've got a namespace in this supervisor cluster, um, but I need to be able to give it to her. And so I need to be able to establish some permissions. So very simply, I'm gonna go in here. I don't have to understand how to do an RBAC binding in Kubernetes or anything like that. I can simply go in because it's tied into my identity sources here and I can search and there is Kelly. She's my DevOps person. She's got a role. I'm gonna give her edit permissions um, over this namespace. And so that in effect is gonna take what is a vSphere admin 
set of commands and there is a capability inside of vCenter that then maps those to Kubernetes um, commands, if you will, and is going to instantiate inside this supervisor cluster effectively a role binding for Kelly that's going to give her edit capabilities on this namespace. And so I know that and you know what, I'm going to just to because you know, we're a little bit new here. Maybe as an administrator, what I want to do is I want to also add myself just in case I need to get in there for, for some reason. So I could add myself um, into this particular uh, place as well. And so I've got some, uh, I've got my, you know, my, my, uh, my permissions set up for this environment. Now, another big challenge, as Kelly was talking about earlier, is like, how do we manage storage in this environment for persistent, you know, volume needs, et cetera, things of that nature. And so, again, I, I get the idea of having to present data stores up to a Kubernetes cluster so that if you've got pods or workloads that need persistent volumes, I know there's these things called storage classes. But again, as, a, as, a, as an ops team, infrastructure team, I'm going to use sort of a familiar policy where I'm just simply going to select that policy, um, which maps to a data store. And I could select more policies if I wanted to. And I'm going to select that. And what that's going to do is just by selecting that policy, it's going to plumb that data store up into the supervisor cluster and specifically uh, make that available for Kelly's namespace to consume should she want to do that. Um, I can also put some governance in here. So maybe what I want to do is I want to limit some CPU. I want to limit some memory. I don't want the workloads that Kelly is, is going to deploy to necessarily consume my entire cluster. So I could do that. I can also put some limits on storage overall or even storage per data store if I had multiple data stores um, that exist. But you know what, I'm feeling sort of generous today. So I'm going to, I'm going to leave it, um, you know, wide open in this regard. The other thing that I've done is I know that Kelly ultimately wants to deploy uh, Kubernetes clusters. And so what I've done is um, VMware has given me this capability to create a content library. And so this is a content library that I've subscribed to online. Um, there is a way to, to bring it in in an air gapped environment. So I don't need to be connected to the internet, but effectively what that's done is it's presented an OVF template here that's based on Photon. OS and that if Kelly wanted to deploy a Kubernetes cluster into her namespace, um, it's automatically set up that she could leverage this image. This happens to be Kubernetes version 1.17. When VMware releases it, I'll have 1.1, uh, excuse me, 1.16. When VMware releases it, I could have 1.17. I could give Kelly some choices if she needed to test things with different Kubernetes versions. In the future, um, as it's on the roadmap, uh, not available today, but in the future, we'll even allow Kelly to bring her own image to me and I could upload it into the content library so that it's available to be consumed. So I basically got the, the primitives there that allow her to um, interact with this cluster. So we've done this scenario here and I've set up a namespace for, you can see it here is Kelly namespace. And so now I, what I want to do is I'm going to sort of switch personas and be Kelly because here's the thing. Kelly knows Kubernetes. She knows pipeline. She knows all this. She has not had a ton of um, interaction with the vSphere, um, you know, environment, if you will. And so I don't want to have to make her learn a whole new way of doing things. Um, I want to give her patterns that are more native. And I see a couple of questions I'm going to get to in just a second here. Um, what I have done in, uh, or what the automation has done for my cluster is that if I take a look at my cluster here, um, and I go over to uh, workload management again, and look at my cluster, I have exposed that, uh, exposed an IP address that she can access that cluster. She wants to use something like cube control or cube kettle, and that's just a binary, a very common binary to interact, um, uh, with, with Kubernetes clusters. It's also very extensible. So what we've done to make her life easier is we have exposed uh, just a simple web page, a way for her to download a vSphere plugin for kubectl for the operating system that she wants. And we put directions right here. She can download this binary. It's a very similar process to downloading just regular cube control. Um, she puts it into her path. She makes it executable. Um, and then over in her jump box, she's going to be ready to uh, interact. 
I'm gonna pause here, just take a look here real quick at the chat and the questions to see content library versus harbor for image availability. Are these related? One's a subset of the other. So uh, Alonzo, a content library in this context is providing the OVA or OVF template that is gonna form the basis when we want to deploy a guest cluster, which is today a TKG cluster on top of the supervisor cluster. That's the primary purpose here. We typically wouldn't use the content library in the same way that we use a Harbor. Harbor images are generally gonna be those pod images or those application images, um, ultimately Helm charts, et cetera, that we can store in there. So think of Harbor as really storing a lot of the images that will be the workloads running, either directly on a supervisor cluster or inside a guest cluster, and the content library really being that VM template that's ultimately gonna create our TKG cluster. And then uh, again, another question here. So today vSphere can only deploy VMware based Kubernetes images. Uh, yeah, that's, um, that, that, that's today. Uh, we provide a Photon OS and we provide the update to that question uh, or to that, uh, we provide the update to that Kubernetes distribution. Uh, and in the future, uh, we will be allowing customers to sort of bring your own image, but that's a roadmap. I don't have a date on when that will be available. All right. So let's jump back into, you know, Kelly's now got this namespace and, you know, she's skeptical of Scotty Ray and who wouldn't be skeptical, right? You know, I, I'm, you know, very new to this, this Kubernetes thing. And so she wants to kind of determine. So we're going to go over here to, uh, to her jump box and she's downloaded the binary here um, and she's read some instructions. And so she wants to sort of interact with uh, this cluster just to see how, you know, typical it is, what it looks like. And so what we've done is we've added a cube control vSphere logon. She's going to log on to that supervisor cluster. So this is the IP address to gain access to the API server that's, that's uh, represented in those three supervisor control VMs. Um, and she's going to log in and she's going to log in with her uh, credentials that I used when I set up uh, her namespace. And actually, you know what? I uh, forgot to do something here. So this is a live demo. This is going to fail. What I'm going to do is just so this looks completely clean, I'm going to remove uh, my legacy cube config here. So this is a uh, uh, jump box here. So I'm going to clean out everything. So this would be just like Kelly was logging in for the first time. Hey, Scotty, quick yeah. question on... Please. Uh, the permissions that you set up, I noticed it was vSphere.local. Would would it also be available to use any Active Directory, LDAP, ADFS identity providers as well? Yep, anything that's tied into the vSphere SSO we can use. So okay. it's got to be from that drop-down menu. Correct. Cool. Yep. Thank you. I Absolutely. have a question regarding uh, the storage that we yeah. just spoke about. We we mapped it. Uh, we mapped a vSAN data store to one particular cluster, right? So how how is it going to treat? Uh, the storage us is it going to be one particular pv which can be consumed by all of it or will there be segregation into different pvs how is so, that handled yeah so the data store is ultimately going to back what um what is referred to as a storage class so that storage class is going to reference that data store that we plumbed up the actual pv creations themselves are going to be done mm -hmm. based on the deployment manifests that either the DevOps team or the developers are using. So that is just sort of a bucket. And if I wanted to present multiple data stores, they would represent themselves as multiple storage classes. And then when the consumer came in to say, I want to deploy a workload that has this persistent, uh, this persistent volume, as a part of their deployment manifest, they are going to specify a particular storage class, which would then manifest down to a particular data store. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Great questions. So, so you can see here that Kelly's logged in with her account. She has access to the following context. She obviously has access uh, to the supervisor cluster. She has access to her namespace here. Now, so what she's going to do is she can use standard cube control, you know, config, use context, you know, to switch the context. This is a Kubernetes uh, pattern here where I'm going to switch into the context of her namespace. Or if she's got some shortcuts that she's used to because she's a developer, she's customized her shell, she knows you know what she wants to do anything that we can use that's sort of native kubernetes um, she can use here so she can use something like kubectx which is a common tool out there to switch the context into her namespace 
Now, I want to make sure that we understand here that this supervisor cluster that she's operating in right now is, again, a management cluster. So it's a little bit locked down. So if Kelly, for instance, wanted to go in and do a cube kettle, get namespaces. I want to get namespaces on this supervisor cluster. You'll notice that it's forbidden. Kelly has the right to her namespace, but she does not have rights as a root level to the supervisor cluster to list all of the things. So a supervisor cluster is a Kubernetes cluster. Kelly does have rights to the namespace in that cluster, but she doesn't have broad rights over that. So that supervisor cluster is a little bit locked down um, for the purpose, because of the purpose that it's gonna be sort of a place where multiple tenants may in fact come in from different namespaces. Hey, so Scotty. Yeah. Do you, do you, so does Kelly always have to log into the supervisor cluster then to interact with her namespaces or is there a, a better way for permissions and log on? She's going to log, she's going to log into the supervisor API um, initially to get access to her namespaces. We can extend that to also give her um, access as we'll show um, into a cluster. Um, so instead of just logging to that, then I would specify the namespace and then there's an argument to specify the cluster. Okay. Um, a guest cluster can be, uh, we can set up our back models and things of that nature, either integrated through SSO or anything that we want to do in that environment. And we can extract Q configs from guest clusters, but the supervisor cluster and working that way is going to be sort of that initial uh, entry point into the environment for her. Yeah. So once, once Kelly's logged in, set everything up, then she's got a team of developers that work under her. We could set up an RBAC model for them to directly log into the cluster, the guest cluster itself. Yeah, and we could give them either. So what's cool about it is that the same process that I use to add her permissions to the namespace, I can actually add developer permissions to that same namespace and they would automatically get plumbed to as users. And then what I could do is I could create role bindings in those guest clusters um, to limit those developers to different namespaces if I wanted to do that as an example. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, Thank you. Absolutely. Sure. All right. So, so Kelly's now in namespace and she's got a couple little demo things that, that she wants to do. She's got a little application here um, called demo, you know, hello. She just wants to test to make sure that this Kubernetes cluster that Scotty allegedly provisioned her uh, works correctly. So she's going to either through a pipeline or, you know, through a base, you know, Kubernetes thing, she's just going to apply a very simple um, you know, uh, application here and it's going to say, okay, service is created, deployment's created. If she wants to take a look at the pods um, that are happening here, she can see that they're, they're pending at the moment here um, because why not, instead of having it run really super fast, uh, get a little pending here, hopefully. All right, so we got a container creating. So the pods are starting to come up um, in our environment here, we'll kind of double check here. All right, so now they're all running. I'm um, gonna we'll take a look here and get the services. So these three pods are deployed in a uh, deployment and they are exposed with an external IP address that comes from that uh, ingress range uh, that we defined earlier. And so we went out and automatically grabbed up, we spun up a, in my case, we spun up an NSX load balancer um, and we assigned it that IP address. And if I go back over here to uh, the environment here and take a look at, um, my uh, my hosts here, I can see under the namespace that I have three pods that are running. These are what are taken a, a couple of different names. Probably in the early days, you heard terms like uh, pod VMs. We've heard native pods. I've now seen them referred to as vSphere pods. These are Kubernetes pods that are running on a para-virtualized Linux kernel that's being scheduled um, directly on the hypervisor. It's a customized VMX uh, process. Uh, the VMM monitor is doing it. We call this process together. Um, that is the para virtualized kernel, the customized VMX, a few different things. We call that grouping together CRX or container runtime. This is specific only to vSphere. Um, this is what allows us to run pods natively without having to have a worker node that is a full blown general purpose OS like Photon or Ubuntu or something of that nature. So these pods are running directly on the hypervisors as first class citizens. And if I wanted to see whether or not the exposure of that service was right, I could pop in my IP address and you know she can get you know her uh, thing here and we can believe that the live demo actually worked, right? So we have um, an application working in this regard. Now, Kelly can 
could you know um, deploy workloads, deploy pods directly into her namespace. Um, she can see those pods, et cetera. But the one thing in addition that Kelly wants to be able to do is she wants to be able to deploy Kubernetes clusters. And so this goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning. We were talking about this idea of cluster API, that is leveraging Kubernetes to deploy Kubernetes. And so this declarative process is super important and super key to the things that we're doing here. Certainly, if I were to take a look at, um, let's see here, oops. This is the manifest for that application. So it said, I want to define a service using service type load balancer. I want to do that for any pod that has a label app, uh, hello Kubernetes. I have a deployment here. Um, I want to create a label for that, you know, app, hello Kubernetes. Um, the image that I'm going to pull from is this gentleman's, you know, demo app here. You're going to pull it if it's not present. Um, and then I've got an environment variable that I can use here. This is a declarative manifest. I declared what I wanted. If I wanted to edit this declaration here, I could simply go up to uh, my replicas and I could change that, let's say to four. And I could come back here and um, I could apply this file. And we can see here that the service didn't change, but the deployment did change. And if I come back over to my environment, in a few seconds, you'll see there's the fourth pod. So I am declaring what I want this deployment to look like. Um, as opposed to logging in and patching an iterative, I'm just simply changing what I want and letting Kubernetes figure it out, at automatically adding it into the virtual server pool, et cetera. And so we can extend the Kubernetes API to not just be declarative around applications, but to be declarative around clusters. So I provided Kelly a base uh, configuration um, that I got from my good friends at VMware um, that has sort of a simple thing. And if you notice up here, we have this thing called Kine and it's a Tanzu Kubernetes cluster. So we have a Kubernetes distribution called TKG um, or in, in the uh, supervised cluster TKC, Tanzu Kubernetes cluster. And so this is now a manifest that provides a high degree of automation around the deployment of a Kubernetes cluster. So I'm gonna give it a name. Right? Kelly wants to say, okay, Kelly, you know, oops, insert here. Go in here and we'll say, okay, this is gonna be Kelly cluster 01. And what namespace? This is the namespace in her, so she has uh, the Kelly namespace in her environment. And then what attributes of this? So we have, again, that content library that's based on that Photon OS image, but we also have the ability to have some different t-shirt sizes uh, for that. So I can have, you know, small, medium, large, best effort guaranteed. Um, and those definitions are in the API. We can, you know, jump in there and see what those are. How many control plane VMs does she want? Does she want one or does she want three, um, you know, to deploy up here? Um, to the question earlier that was asked, this is the storage class. So these VMs are gonna have a, um, you know, they're gonna be deploying persistent disks. And so what storage class, you know, is there? So this is that policy um, that I want to deploy those VMs on. How many worker nodes um, do I want? Do I want two, do I want three, do I want five? Um, what size do I want them to be? Uh, and then what image are we using? Again, in my lab, I've only got the one image here, but this is where Kelly could very easily pivot potentially between different versions of Kubernetes as she wants to define them. And then inside the guest cluster, um, we utilize, today we utilize Calico. Uh, we're also gonna be adding support for things like Project Antria, uh, which is uh, our open source project uh, with more of an NSX uh, feel to it. This is not the supervisor cluster where NSX is today, but this is inside, this is for basic pod networking um, inside the guest cluster that may be deployed. And so a very simple, um, you know, uh, manifest for this and she can save this file. And then she wants to save this file. She could feed that into a pipeline. She could feed that into a CD tool like Argo CD or anything like that. Or she could just simply do a kubectl apply And she could say, all right, I want this uh, guest cluster deployed. And so if I take a look at this guest cluster, uh, 
I can see here that this is what we have declared into the Kubernetes API uh, with all of that um, into the supervisor cluster. Um, we've declared, you know, sort of the calico, the blocks, you can see the distributions here. Um, we can see the topology that we've done. A lot of stuff here is pending because obviously things are, are being created, nodes and the VMs that back those. And if I come back over to my vSphere environment, you can see I have a new object here. And in a few minutes, what we'll see is we'll see an OVF uh, deployment task happening where it's going to grab that OVF package from the content library and it's going to deploy an OVF just like it normally would. Now, this process in my lab will take probably 15 to 20 minutes, um, which, you know, create us a lot of little, uh, a little tap dancing. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a page from every great cooking show that ever existed. And we're sort of going to say, okay, well, what if we've already got uh, the cluster deployed? And so you can note, you'll notice here that I've got this other test in namespace that's already deployed. And I already have a Kubernetes a guest cluster deployed in this environment here. So what we're going to do is we are going to uh, log into that environment again, just so that there's no tricks. I am going to remove uh, my uh, cube config. Oops, if I could type correctly. And again, I'm only doing this to show exactly what it would look like. Now, I didn't give Kelly permissions to that. Uh, that namespace. So I'm going to log in under a different administrator here. So you can see I got kubectl vSphere login. That's the same. Now I'm specifying the argument Tanzu Kubernetes cluster namespace. That's the test namespace. And the Tanzu Kubernetes cluster name is tkco one mm small is the name of my cluster that I've already got there. And I'm going to log in as administrator at vSphere.local my super secret password of VMware one bang, which by the way, if you hack my lab, that'll pretty much give you the keys to every kingdom. You'll notice here that as the administrator, I can see Kelly's namespace. Why? Well, because I added myself to that namespace, but I also have access to the test namespace and to this cluster. And if I were to change the context um, over to this guest cluster, now I'm in this guest cluster. So I am logged into that guest cluster that's running. So now let's take a look here. When I did the kubectl get uh, namespaces before I got an error because I was at the supervisor context level, now I'm actually in a guest cluster. So I can see the namespaces that are there. If I want to take a look at storage classes, I can see the storage classes. So that's that vSphere 7 with Kubernetes that's been plumbed up inside there. And I am now a full admin into this environment where I can do things that I, you know, uh, might want to show or do. So as an example, maybe one of the things I want to do is I want to make sure that my cluster can be managed uh, via Wavefront or Tanzu observability. And so I can create a namespace there for Wavefront. I can, you know, go over here, um, you know, to Wavefront. And then what I could do is do a simple... Um, I can use Helm, you know, which I could get from the Wavefront environment here. I can install um, essentially the Wavefront proxies and everything that's going on inside here. And so it says, okay, look, Wavefront's deployed. And so now it's set up and ready to configure, you know, metrics from my Kubernetes cluster. And I can go into uh, my environment here. And then maybe what I do is I'll, I'll head up here and um, check out Wavefront. We'll log in, go into my summary here, and let's see if I can find my cluster, TKC, there's my cluster. And so it's going to take a little bit of time for the data to sort of populate um, in this environment, but you can see that it's, you know, that it's already there. Um, and so over the next few minutes, these things will start to populate with the, with the, with the data that's being corrected. So this cluster is in fact a fully formed Kubernetes cluster that I can interact and, and deal. And so then to the earlier question that was asked, I can set up role bindings, I can set up namespaces, deploy applications, just like I would any other Kubernetes distribution that's there um, and, and work through it, if you will. So I'm, I'm not as restricted as I am in working with a supervisor cluster, which is especially context. Okay, I have a question here. Why do we have to create guest clusters to run pods when we already have the hypervisors running as worker nodes that does the same job? 
This is a great question. Um, so this is always the big question about, you know, if we have native pod constructs, why don't we run everything as native pods or why don't we run, uh, you know, guest clusters that are in there? I think there are a couple of reasons um, why we still want to have both sets of abstractions. And to be perfectly frank here, I'm not entirely sure that we know yet what we don't know. Um, and what I mean by that is that this capability of a first class uh, citizen on a, you know, as a pod as a first class is, is a relatively new construct. I think a couple of the things that come into play are this. Number one, this again, as I showed you earlier, the supervisor cluster is a, a Kubernetes cluster, but it is a relatively locked down cluster. So if a developer or a workload person of some sort wanted to run something directly onto it, um, there potentially could be times where they may not have the permissions to be able to do something because we've, we've locked that supervisor cluster down because of the, 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 the role that it plays in our environment here. I think the other thing is more from a tenancy and availability perspective. When we look at uh, deploying Kubernetes and platforms and things, we should be looking at things from an availability as well as from like a blast zone perspective from security deal. The ability for me to set up guest clusters and run pods natively in there gives me the ability to uh, provide another level of isolation between different teams because this is one, you know, th these hosts may be massive hosts, I may not want to be able to give everybody direct access to it because I may be running, you know, staging and prod, or I may have different app teams there. And so it gives me a little bit of a tenancy model. I think the other thing that um, is going to become apparent is that uh, there are going to be reasons to test different versions of Kubernetes simultaneously. Um, as the Kubernetes API evolves or potentially deprecates uh, commands or functions, you might have developers that want to test a pod workload on a Kubernetes distribution. The Kubernetes distribution for, for the guest cluster um, can be much more flexible than, the, than, the, than the, 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 the version for the supervisor cluster, if you will. And so that ability to have multiple versions and, and do those kinds of things, I think are important as well. And the one thing I, I didn't show today, but if you think about it now, is that we could put these manifests We could put these manifests into, let's say, a Git repo and have that Git repo keyed off of something like Argo CD for a continuous deployment capability. And now if uh, Kelly wants to, if she wants to um, expand this, she could go in uh, to the repo. She could make uh, an issue, scale this out to two, do a commit and have uh, essentially the similar GitOps type pattern that people are using uh, for applications or for pods and now actually apply that to the Kubernetes cluster. So I certainly don't wanna argue the point that a lot of people are gonna be excited about native pods and potentially run pods um, you know, as first class citizens, but I definitely think there's still a very big place for uh, running guest clusters in the environment um, as well. But I do think that this space is gonna evolve. Um, I think we're gonna see different types of workloads. It wouldn't surprise me if we see uh, potentially some shared services runs of native pods potentially those high performant uh, requirement for pods, maybe functions. Um, those are gonna be different types of things that can be seen as well. So I hope that this was a good intro and an overview of vSphere 7 with Kubernetes and putting it into the context of a day in the life and sort of that interaction between Kelly who might be on my DevOps team um, and myself who might be more of a classic infra team and how we can allow me as a, as a platform provider, patterns and, and, and work capabilities that are more familiar to me. And Kelly, on the same hand, she can be doing the things for her development places or her development teams and peers um, that are more native to the things that she wants to look at. Um, I do believe, again, that this is going to be a, an ever-evolving space. It's amazing how fast things are moving uh, in this environment. But in the last five minutes, Steve, Kelly, um, the other uh, hosts on the call, I'd be happy to open it up and take some questions uh, from the team if we need. Yeah, I don't see anything in chat or Q&A, but I do have a question. Sure. Um, regarding the CNI and just networking in general, is it safe to say the supervisor cluster requires NSXT, whereas the guest clusters are Calico out of the box, right? 
Correct. That, correct? that is that is the current state today, Steve. Supervisor cluster is mandatory in SXT today um, mm -hmm. as the current version of the, of, the, of the product and this, you know, whatever, July 2020. Um, the guest clusters are out of the box CNI Calico. However, by default, um, the load balancing service in the underlying NSXT is what provides the load balancer for, um, for applications that are there. You have the option to do other things like the advanced load balancer, AKA Avi or Metal LB or Contour, things like that um, inside of guest clusters uh, very easily. Um, you can do that. Um, there has been talk of maybe some other options. As I said, I think that Project Antria um, is going to evolve um, to be another option inside of, of guest clusters. But the current state of the platform today, Steve, you are absolutely correct. Supervisors NSXT mandated. Um, the TKC or the guest cluster is going to be Calico out of the box by default. Okay, cool. Uh, uh, Scotty, I just hey, Scotty, it's, it's Dale. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to understand if uh, the node affinity that's there in upstream Kubernetes, will, will that get uh, will that get translated to our uh, node affinity in, in a DRS affinity like VM should run on this host? So when 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 I apply a taint on some pods, will it, will it get translated and will I be able to see that on the cluster settings or is it is it handled only by uh, the native pod? No, are you turning in terms of from a from a pods that are deployed directly on the supervisor cluster? Right, right. That's a really good question. I know that there are some tie ins to uh, the resource scheduler to make sure that those things are scheduled out. Um, I know that inside the guest cluster, it's straight Kubernetes. So no affinity is no affinity. Um, in the okay. supervisor cluster, I'm not entirely positive as to whether or not um, I could do a node affinity and reference the ESX host. That's a question I'm going to need to follow up on. I do not know the answer to that. No worries. No worries. Thank you. Yeah. Node affinity. Any other questions? Before we, uh... Hey, Scotty. One, yeah. um, I just wanted to clarify one point about uh, worker nodes versus guest clusters. Yep. So what I think I heard you say is that we will not – get the Kubernetes updates quite as quick on vSphere, meaning the worker nodes is what we might be able to do on the guest clusters. Is that an let accurate me, statement? Let me say it a little, a slightly different way, Dale. Um, the update for the Kubernetes version that the supervisor cluster is running so if I take a look here at workload management and you can see this is the current version of the supervisor cluster. That supervisor cluster version is delivered in the form of a vCenter patch or update. And so it doesn't have to be an upgrade to a different version of vCenter, but we'll deliver that in terms of patches with respect to vCenter. The uh, Tanzu Kubernetes cluster content library those can be done out of tree. So in other words, I don't have to upgrade or update my ESX host necessarily to have a different version of Kubernetes running in the guest cluster. I do believe there's a policy, I don't know if it's N2 or N-3 that the, that the product team is going for, but the idea here is that my supervisor cluster is gonna be controlled by a vCenter patch. My Kubernetes cluster uh, may be controlled um, separately or will be controlled separately uh, by providing another photon image. So to the point, let's assume, Dale, that you had an update come through and this goes to 1.8 in the supervisor cluster. Well, when you update that to 1.8, then that means your supervisor cluster is at 1.8 uh, or 1.18. If I want to have a guest cluster that's running at 1.16 or 1.17 because there's a different you know, API characteristic or I need something like that, I can't do that if the supervisor cluster is at 1.18 natively. I can do that only in the context of a guest cluster. So it gives me some more flexibility. I don't want to make a comment on speed or like how fast yeah. things are going to go, but it's really just more yeah. about the guest clusters give us a more flexible construct where the supervisor cluster, once you upgrade or patch that supervisor cluster, that's going to be the version that's there. And if your deployments want to test different things out in the API, then that's that's going to be uh, the requirement there. No, that was super helpful. Thank yep. you. Thank you. 
And Steve and Kelly, I apologize. I do have a customer call that I probably need to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to, to get you better to. run. But I hope uh, no. Well, thanks for thanks for uh, having me, Kelly. Enjoyed it. Um, and uh, as always, gang, feel free to reach out um, if uh, if I can help or uh, provide any uh, further clarity. And uh, Steve, I'll try to get a question an answer on the note affinity uh, to provide in the show notes or things. Excellent. Uh, awesome. I don't see any other questions. You got to run. So. I think we're done here. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Scotty. Appreciate your time today. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll let everybody go. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take care.